Hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Monday, the 22nd of September. You're tuned in to our mid-morning newscast here on Arirang TV. I'm Mark Broom. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. President Park Geun-hye in Ottawa on a state visit says Korea and Canada's free trade deal will take their relationship to the next level. The agreement is set to be inked in the next 24 hours. Korea's finance minister says he aims to lift Korea's growth rate to 6% at current prices and boost government spending to speed up the country's sluggish economic recovery. Plus, as tens of thousands of Kurds flee into Turkey to escape an Islamic State offensive, U.S. President Barack Obama says the United States and a broad coalition of nations are coming together to combat the threat posed by the extremists. But our top story this morning, President Park Geun-hye has officially begun her state visit to Ottawa and she was welcomed by the Governor-General there. The highlight of the President's trip, however, will be the signing of a bilateral FTA later on this Monday. Our Che Yusun, who is travelling with the President, tells us how Korea will benefit from the deal. Receiving a warm welcome from the Governor-General of Canada, who is the Viceroy to Queen Elizabeth II, President Bach said she hopes the soon-to-be-signed bilateral FTA will maximize the joint potential for co-prosperity and contribute to international peace. Seoul and Ottawa will sign the trade deal on Monday after President Bach and Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper's summit. The FDA will remove tariffs on 99 percent of traded value in the next 10 years and it's expected to raise Korea's GDP by 0.04 percent over the same period. Our major products are automobiles, auto parts, washing machines and refrigerators. The 6 to 8 percent tariffs will be removed within the next three years. With the latest pact, Korean automakers hope to beat out their Japanese rivals in Canada, its fifth largest export market. The deal will help Korea diversify its exports and usher in more investment from Canadian businesses. Seoul, meanwhile, has exempted nearly one-fifth of sensitive agricultural goods such as rice and earmarked two billion U.S. dollars to help Korean agriculture and livestock industries stay competitive both at home and abroad. Keeping momentum from the trade pack, Korea hopes to expand cooperation with Canada in areas of energy, science and Arctic studies. The FDA, after it's signed on Monday, will be sent for parliamentary approval in both countries. Choi yoo Arirang News, Ottawa. Now back here in Korea and the leaders of the country's main rival parties are expected to meet as early as this Monday in hopes of breaking a prolonged political stalemate. The new Politics Alliance for Democracy's newly elected interim chief, Moon Hee Sang, has openly expressed his intent to meet with the ruling Senuri Party chief, Kim Woo Sung, uh, sometime this week. They are expected to discuss the political stalemate over a special bill on April's ferry disaster and hopefully the normalization of the National Assembly. Korea's National Assembly has been at a standstill because of this prolonged political feud between the ruling and opposition parties over the special bill that authorizes an in-depth investigation into the government over the Seoul Ho ferry sinking. Now, unfazed by strong warnings from North Korea, a group of South Korean activists are continuing their campaign of flying anti-Pyongyang leaflets across the border. Their activities are expected to heighten into Korean tensions that have been showing some signs of improving in recent weeks. Our Son Jung-in reports. North Korea has taken issue with the cross-border spread of anti-Pyongyang leaflets by civic groups a month after it remained tight-lipped on South Korea's proposal for high-level inter-Korean talks. The North is demanding such provocations be halted if Seoul wants to resume inter-Korean dialogue. It went on to threaten a possible retaliation, saying the leaflets are a more grave provocation than shooting and shelling. The anti-Pyongyang leaflet campaign waged by civic activists, mostly North Korean defectors in the South, has been going on for years despite calls from other activists for them to stop. 
The balloons flown into the North are known to be well liked by North Koreans because they contain one U.S. dollar bills, medicine, and other daily necessities, along with hundreds of thousands of leaflets denouncing the three generation power transfer in the North. Experts say the North is reacting strongly now, mainly because the leaflets criticize its political system and its young leader Kim Jong un. Others say it's using the situation as a means to pressure the South. North Korea views its system and dignity as its top priority. So that's why they are showing a very strong reaction. But we also need to consider the possibility that the North is taking advantage of the situation to put more pressure on the South. Although there has not been any serious reaction from the North, experts believe inter Korean ties are not likely to improve anytime soon. Son Jung in Arirang News. Now, South Korea's finance minister is making the case for the government's new budget proposal, which contains the biggest spending increase in seven years, but is aimed at lifting the country out of its current economic slump. Our Kim Hyun bin reports. Korea's finance minister Chae Kyung Hun says that his goal is to lift Korea's growth rate to 6% at current prices and increase government spending to give the country a much needed jot out of a prolonged slow recovery. On the sidelines of the G20 meeting of finance ministers and central bank chiefs in Australia over the weekend, Chae made a case for the government's recently unveiled 2015 budget proposal, which contains a 5.7% spending increase, the biggest in seven years. Che said the increase is needed to boost the growth rate and bring about an economic recovery. The pace of recovery has been very slow since the Cerro Ferry disaster in April. The tragic accident had another tragic consequence in that consumers and businesses cut spending in its wake, leaving the growth rate in the second quarter at a mere 0.5 percent. The government spending proposal will result in a $32 billion budget deficit, representing 2.1 percent of the nation's GDP. But Che says he expects the spending increase will bring the growth rate back up to 4 percent by next year. And although the country's debt to GDP ratio is expected to increase next year to a record high of 35.7 percent next year, it's still one third of the OECD average. The finance minister emphasized that support for businesses is necessary in a stagnant economy such as this, with the increased activity eventually leading to greater revenue. Kim Hyun bin Arirang News. And staying with uh, economic news, the Korea Pension Association has unveiled a plan to revise the pension scheme for public servants that requires them to pay more but actually receive less. There have been calls for the overhaul of the current pension system, which costs taxpayers billions of dollars each year. The new plan requires civil servants to pay about 10% of their income as a monthly premium by the year 2026. That's up from the current 7%. The government's contribution to the scheme will also increase to 10% from 7%. The plan also calls for a 34% cutback in how much they receive after they retire from their jobs. The ruling Senate Party will review this proposal on this Monday. Now, the International Telecommunications Union meeting, often referred to as the ICT Olympics, will begin very soon in Korea's southern port city of Busan. Now, this is a very, very high-profile event that could, in fact, shift how countries and people use and access the Internet. Our Hwang Jie has the details. The countdown has begun. In less than a month, the 19th ITU Plenipotentiary Conference kicks off in Korea's southern port city of Busan. The ITU, or the International Telecommunications Union, is an information and communications arm of the United Nations. It sets technological standards, allocates radio frequencies and satellite orbits, and works to improve the quality of communication services. And for the meeting, some 3,000 government delegates from the ITU's 193 member states will participate, along with some 150 information and communications technology ministers and high-level officials. 
Around 70 agenda items, including internet related public policy issues, cybersecurity, and online child protection, are expected to brought to the table. It's Korea's first time hosting the ITU conference that takes place every four years and the second time in Asia after Japan hosted it in 1994. So it's a very good opportunity for our countries to make our role as you know, the global leading country in the field of the ICT global policy making and the global diplomacy. Korea is likely to raise discussion topics such as Internet of Things and ICT convergence, both of which are closely linked to the government's creative economy drive. The ICT ministry believes the global event will lay the foundation for the country's communication industry to reach the next level and raise Busan's exposure on the world stage. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Korea's largest automaker, Hyundai Motor, is giving itself an image overhaul. It has set its sights on becoming a premium brand by expanding sales of its high-end sedans instead of its traditional cheap and cheerful models, which actually made the automaker such a hit in the first place. For this week's Industry Insight, here's our Song ji -son. This is a crossroad in Seoul's rich and hip Gangnam-gu district, where imported car showrooms are peppered along the street. Just across Mercedes-Benz and BMW, Hyundai Motor recently opened its first brand exhibition gallery called Motor Studio, underlining the Korean automaker's ambition to upgrade its brand image. Hyundai's premium sedan model, the Genesis, is rotating on a wall, showcasing its platform. The launch of this brand gallery underscores Group Chairman Chong won ambition to brand Hyundai Motor as a premium automaker. Hyundai has been struggling in the U.S. market this year, losing ground to Japanese automakers, which have benefited from a combination of the weakened Japanese yen and discount promotions. Hyundai aims to counter by emphasizing its high-end line of automobiles, something it hopes will boost its brand image and ultimately sales across the board. Early signs are encouraging in the all-important U.S. market. The automaker's overall market share in the U.S. is in the mid-4 percent range, but its share in the luxury car market was at nearly 7 percent last year. Hyundai aims to push that mark to 8 percent by the end of this year. If the goals are achieved, the new Genesis sedan will be the reason. It's the focal point of the company's strategy in the United States. Hyundai says the sedan's performance is on par with BMW 7 Series, but is priced about 10 percent lower than its targeted competition, the BMW 5 Series. Sales of Genesis in the U.S. more than doubled in June from the beginning of this year after launching the new model. That boosted the sales portion of mid to large size sedans from 53 percent last year to 56 percent by end of July. But experts say Hyundai has a long way to go before it can sell itself as a high-end automaker. It marks only the beginning for Hyundai's challenge to become a premium brand in all aspects. For instance, when BMW launches its new 5 Series, they improve a lot on the performance by reducing its weight by at least 100 kilograms and enhancing its output by 15 percent. Hyundai must focus on competency when launching new models, as they seem to lack that improvement with heavier weights and less fuel efficiency. And those same rules apply in the domestic market, where combined shares of Hyundai and Kia Motors at home last month dipped below 70 percent for the first time in seven years as more consumers turned to German diesel models with higher fuel efficiencies. Song ji Arirang News. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following on this Monday morning. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by at the News Centre. Good morning to you, Eunice. Good morning, Mark. Now, we're seeing a massive wave of Syrians, mostly Kurds, pouring into Turkey, uh, escaping an onslaught by Islamic State militants. This, uh, as U.S. President Barack Obama is set to press the global community for more action at the U.N. this week. 
That's right, Mark. It'll be a busy week at the United Nations. President Obama is set to chair a Security Council meeting on Wednesday, during which he's expected to pitch a sweeping new resolution to fight off terrorists. Now, it would include specific anti-terror measures, including placing global travel bans on would-be jihadists, freezing their assets, and also punishing uncooperative countries with sanctions. This resolution is said to be receiving widespread support this as Kurdish forces in Syria are struggling to fight off Islamic State militants since battles erupted last Thursday. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said 64 villages in northern Syria have fallen under IS control with some 800 Kurds missing. Turkey's chief of disaster management most said most of the 100,000 Syrian refugees were running from an area near the border town of Kobani with more expected to come. A local defense official said the militants were targeted were targeting rather fleeing civilians as well and that they were armed with tanks, artillery, and multiple rocket launchers. World leaders are also set to address environmental issues at the UN this week, and ahead of it, people from around the globe poured into streets to call for action. 40,000 marchers are said to have showed up in London demanding governments to cut carbon emissions and stop climate change. Organizers in Australia said as many as 20,000 had participated in rallies in Melbourne as the country faces severe droughts, brush fires and storms. In Manhattan, more than 100,000 people took part in the so-called People's Climate March that also brought out U.N. Secretary General Pan Ki-moon, actor Mark Ruffalo and former U.S. Vice President Al Gore. The U.N. summit on Tuesday is due to bring together 125 heads of state with the hope of reaching a universal agreement by the end of next year. And let's turn now to some political news. The months-long political discord in Afghanistan has been settled. Afghanistan's election commission named former finance minister Ashraf Ghani as the country's president-elect on Sunday after he agreed to form a unity government. A deal signed in Kabul by both presidential contenders would allow runner-up Abdullah Abdullah to nominate a CEO with authorities similar to those of a prime minister. Both sides had accused the other of election fraud following a runoff vote in June. And shifting to Yemen now, an agreement has been settled there as well after its prime minister gave up his seat following weeks of political crisis. The Yemeni government, headed by its president, Abdrabu Mansur Hadi, signed a pact with Shia Houthi rebels, agreeing to form a new government in three days that allows the group and southern separatists to nominate a new prime minister. On Sunday, rebels had claimed government headquarters, key ministries and state broadcasters, scores of people have died and hundreds of others have run in the clashes in the capital of Sana'a. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia and beyond. On air, on your mobile and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, European Union also offers 15 Now, a great director, fantastic actors and a solid script are and will probably always be the key ingredients to making a great or classic film. But in this day and age, it doesn't hurt either to fully utilise other modern means to enhance your movie's magic. And just as Korea's movie industry is uh, taking leaps and bounds forwards, so is innovation and artistry especially in the field of special effects makeup. Our Kim Jeon reports. Movie makeup artists play a crucial role in films such as Eunggyo, in which 37-year-old Park Kei plays a man who ages into his 70s. It took almost eight hours to transform him to realistically create the sophisticated senior he portrays. 
Korean makeup effects artists challenged themselves further, making a teenager look like an 80-year-old man. 13-year-old actor Cho Song Mok who played a teenage boy with the aging disease progeria in the film My Brilliant Life had to go through a process that took hours to complete every time he sat in the makeup chair. They enlisted techniques innovated by Hollywood's special makeup artist Greg Canham to create natural-looking wrinkles and age spots under a thin silicon mask. Real progeria patients can look unsightly, so we try to maintain the actor's cute, childlike image. The makeover not only raised the movie's believability level, but also chose acting. I think Cho Song Mok is an amazing kid. He never complained even when he had to go through the age makeup process for five hours every day. My Brilliant Life has shown makeup techniques similar to those used in the award-winning blockbuster The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. That film amazed audiences as its lead Brad Pitt played a character that aged backwards, from an old man to a baby. With the development of Korean filmmaking and special effects, industry watchers expect local movies to stand shoulder to shoulder with those made in Hollywood. Kim Jeong, Anina News. And a good Monday morning to you all as we go into our 2014 Asian Games coverage. Now, South Korea won their first gold medal when Lee Ha-sung won gold in Wushu over the weekend. But the biggest event of the weekend went to the men's 200-meter freestyle swimming event as Park Tae-hwan went after his first gold medal. But what started off as a battle between Park Tae-hwan and China's Sun Yang, Japan's Kosuke Higano Hagano would finish first with a final time of 1 minute 45.23 seconds for the gold medal. Meanwhile, Sun Yang would finish with the silver medal as Park Tae-hwan finishes with a rather disappointing bronze medal after coming in at a final time of 1 minute 45.85 seconds. And now moving over to weightlifting where after Am Yun Chor broke his own world record during the 56kg event, another North Korean broke yet another world record during the 62kg men's event. Kim Eun Guk, who's only 159 centimeters tall, lifts 154 kilograms in the snatch, breaking a 12-year-old record. At the same time, the North Korean, who held the combined world record of 327 kilograms, which he set during the 2012 London Olympics, he set a new combined record as well with a total of 332 kilograms for North Korea's second gold medal in the Asian Games. Now, meanwhile, over in the men's air pistol event, Chin jong oh failed to win his first individual goal during the Asian Games, falling short in the 50-meter event and winning a bronze medal in the 10-meter event. But the biggest star was 17-year-old Kim chung yong who won two gold medals on Sunday. After winning gold in the 10-meter team event, the 17-year-old comes back and wins the 10-meter individual gold medal as well after shooting 201.2 points in the final. A bright future ahead of Kim chung yong as he's quickly becoming Korea's next ace in the men's air pistol event. And now shifting over to the football matches where both the men's and women's team cruise through with their third win of the tournament. Now first off over on the men's side, Korea versus Laos, Lee jong ho would give Korea the 1-0 first half lead with the goal in the 41st minute before Kim sung dae scores again for the Korean national team, adding the second goal in the 88th minute as Korea wins 2-0. Meanwhile, over to the women's tournament, where South Korean women's team continue to dominate their opponents as they beat Maldives 13-0 with 10 different players scoring in the match. The team has so far scored 28 goals in three matches in the Asian Games. And now finishing things off, let's take a look at how the medal count looks so far after three days as South Korea added four gold medals in fencing and three gold medals in judo on Sunday. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs.
Good morning. Beautiful autumn day is in store to kick off the new week under lots of sun, which should stick around throughout the day and across the nation. And you might want to make the best of fine weather while you can, as we have Typhoon Fung Wong on the way. So Typhoon Fung Wong is a bit weaker than the previous typhoons that we had, but still it's expected to sweep the peninsula, uh, bringing high tide, strong winds and heavy rainfall to the southern regions in Jeju as they will be indirectly affected by typhoon starting tomorrow. And on Wednesday, the whole nation will be receiving torrential rain of between 50 to 150 millimeters. So please be aware of that. But again, today will be another glorious autumn day with highs peaking to 29 in the capital and Daegu, while Gwangju and Busan will be rising to 29 and 26. Now for other regions, it looks like Jeju Island and Daejeon will top out at 25 and 28, while Dokdo should see highs of 22. Now the weather outlook in Incheon for today, where the Asian Games are in full swing, should be pleasant as well under clear blue skies. Well, that's all for me at this hour, and let's send it back to Mark in the studio. Well, thank you very much, Gion, for the weather there. And that's going to do it from us for now. Korea Today is coming up at the top of the hour. Have a fabulous day and thanks for watching. Goodbye.